I'm Michael Moore, and thank you uh, for tuning in. My guest today is the incredible uh, film director, uh, the man who gave us Platoon, uh, Wall Street, Born on the Fourth of July, Salvador, so many films uh, that he wrote and directed. And before that, he wrote Scarface and, um, and other films. So, um, but I'm really honored to have him here today. And I want to welcome you, Oliver Stone. Thank you so much for being on Rumble. Well, thank you, Michael. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. The year is 1989. And I have just made my first film. I'm, I'm nobody. And um, I made a film called Roger and Me. And in that same year, you made Born on the Fourth of July. And eventually, uh, in ni early 1990, were the Oscars for that year. So I, I finally got to meet you. And we got to talking. And the subject got around to, you know, did I think the next film would be a documentary? Or did I want to make, you know, uh, you know, narrative films, fiction films, whatever. And you said, well, I'm, you know, I'm actually make, <laughs> I'm making my next film right now out on the, the scenes we're doing now are the, out on the beach in, I think, Santa Monica. He said, why don't you, you said to me, why don't you come on out and, uh, and, and hang out? I'll show you. You can see, because I'd never been to a real film set before, a real film. Huh. And so, I don't know if it was the next day or two or whatever, I went out there. And you set me up in a, in a chair. And every now and then you would uh, tell me what's going on and why you were doing the things that you were doing and all that. It was just so fascinating. I was just, I literally was like a kid in the candy shop. Huh. And, and I stayed with you that whole night. And if you're, I, you probably don't remember which night this is, but it was the night where you were filming, I think Val Kilmer out on a balcony of a second story, of a second floor of a house. And there was a large moon, a big moonlight. Uh, yeah. And, and it wasn't the moon. It was just a, <laughs> it was just a cardboard thing that when you see it in the movies, it looks like the moon is way up there in the sky, a quarter million miles away. It was just some dude holding a thing that was lit with an orange light to make it look like it was it was the moon. Um, but um, anyways, I really appreciated that. I did. I was nobody, and, and it get, it got me inspired. Of course, I didn't. I didn't. I, I eventually made a narrative film, but it. It was just, uh, so people would say to me, if, so wh what film school did you go to? I said, oh, I went to the Oliver Stone Santa Monica uh, film school <laughs> on the beach. But yeah. anyway, that, uh, uh, so it's a long time since then. The film moments are different than real life. So yeah. although it seems like a long time ago, it, when you refer to a film moment, it comes back to me right away. It's like I'm in that moment still. I remember vividly the early days of the shoot because that was young in the film. The doors. And, uh, the, the scene at the, at, the, at the seashore when he dances to the moon and then he goes up to the rooftop. Yeah, yeah. it was very haunting stuff. It's true, it was a fake moon, but it worked. It yeah. really worked. Uh, but, but I want to talk to you, and, and, and you've got a, a book out. You finally, you've written a, a memoir, essentially. Yeah. It's an amazing book, and it, it's called Chasing the Light. And there are so many stories in here about your filmmaking career and about how you got into film. And I just want to... After you got back from Vietnam, you say in the book, about a year afterwards, you were trying to figure out what to do and go to, should go to college or whatever. And, and um, a friend of yours uh, says, uh, go, go and uh, get a film degree. And you said, a film degree, is that a thing? And I'm, I'm paraphrasing you here. And, and, and your friend says, yes, you can get a degree by just watching movies all day. <laughs> just go. And you thought, Wow. That's a degree because you loved going to the movies. You talk about how your dad took you to the movies uh, when you were a kid. You saw Paths of Glory with him and all these you know, great films or whatever. And you grew up in New York City, so you were, you know, a ton of movie theaters everywhere, uh, all kinds of movie theaters. And uh, so you went to NYU and you applied to, to get what I think you imply in the book. Is it a fairly easy degree to get a film degree? <laughs> with no idea really what that meant. And, and, and you're being taught by some incredible teachers and professors and intellectuals about movies and film, whatever. But also one of your teachers was a, I believe, 26-year-old Martin Scorsese. Uh, yes, at first. So just take us from there and tell us exactly 
you know, I grew up uh, in Manhattan and my parents were well to do and I, they were very strong parents, but they were not fit for each other. One was from, mom, mom was from France. My father was a soldier, Lieutenant Colonel in World War II. He picked her up on the street and he brought her back to the United States. She broke off her engagement with another young, another man. He was about 15 years older. And uh, it was a whirlwind romance, sort of like a Clark Gable kind of thing. And uh, I grew up under the illusion for 15 years that they were, they were in love with each other. And I had, it. it was a magical childhood because I had two cultures, two languages, uh, and uh, they seemed very happy together but how wrong i was you know they shipped me off to boarding school perhaps they knew something more than i did but they knew that i shouldn't be around i was the only child too so it makes right. it worse so it's, right. a, it's a small family and they uh, they they divorced or they separated there was an ugly story but you know my mother had a lover for the first time and my father it turned out had many lovers and many women since world war ii it mm. was a promiscuous generation in many ways sort of i think john updike hit that note in rabbit that rabbit series he kind of yeah. caught the madness of connecticut suburban life people were the 60s were very liberating how unfortunately i was shocked uh, i just didn't know this was going on and and he told my dad told me all this on the phone you know because he he should have come down and seen me but you know everybody was very upset my mother was deeply upset because she'd been locked out of the house and <laughs> her credit card taken away. She'd spent a lot of money. He had made money. He was well to do, but he, he earned an income and every year, you know, she, she spent too much and he was in debt and that shocked me too. So here, I, you know, he's a hundred thousand dollars in debt in 1960, uh, two, three, right. It was a big number and he never got out of that debt the rest of his life, which is why I wrote about him as a victim in the sense of a new capitalistic Wall Street that didn't exist before. And mom went off into her own world for a while and uh, I needed her, but I just, I couldn't, I couldn't forgive her. I've, that one thing leads to another. I, there were two, two vert, I went to Vietnam twice actually. Uh, I had to get away. I, I dropped out of Yale University, went to uh, Vietnam and, uh, taught school there for you two went, terms. Yeah, you went to teach. You didn't go there as a soldier. Yeah, as a teacher, yeah. yeah. It was a year off from college. They didn't, they had that, they allowed me to do it. In those, those, in those days, it was not a program like it's become. And I changed completely. I mean, it was another world out there, another world. And Asia opened my eyes to so much depth, so much volume, so many people, the smells, the scents, the sexuality. Anyway, uh, I went off and, uh, came back. I went to the Merchant Marine. I was a wiper in the Merchant Marine. I traveled all over these countries there. Came back, wrote a novel about it. So I always was a writer from my earliest days. And that's my basis as a writer-director. I used to write for my father. He used to pay me money, 25 cents in the 50s, to write little stories every week for him. And hmm. the 25 cents went a long way in those days. And I'd buy a classic comic. I don't know if you ever know those. They were great. Sure. comic book versions of great novels. Yes. That was my sense of literature. And uh, so writing was sort of ingrained in me by him, but I didn't, I only did it for the money. That was the only reason. And when I finally uh, went to film school, I kind of, you have to say that I came back from Vietnam. The I'll put it this way. I went back to Vietnam. I came back, you wrote the back, book. You went back as a soldier. You enlisted. I, I came back, wrote, wrote a book that yeah. became, was finally published in 1997. It was called A Child's Night Dream. And in it, it was pretty wild story, a 19 year old kid, pretentious. It was, it was huge, it was feverish. It had a lot of, for me, it was like a Rambo kind of poem, but uh, it, it was rejected at the time and uh, kind of disappointed and feeling like an egomaniac and narcissist. I just changed my name back to my birth name and I went to the army with the idea I was suicidal and I was dark and very dark. And I thought, you know, listen, I can't, I don't have the guts to kill myself. I really don't. But, you know, I'm going to throw my, my destiny to the gods and see if I'm in, if they want me, they'll take me. Uh, that was my idea. And I went through the Vietnam experience, resigned to whatever happened. I didn't complain about it. It was, you know, it was what was going to happen. 
I had a classical education that way. I was, you know, I didn't, I couldn't relate to my generation uh, in many ways. I mean, George Bush was at Yale University with me when I was there as a freshman. He would be typical of the privileged kind of background that allows mm -hmm. him to skip the draft and lie and do all the things he did. So is Bill Clinton. So is Donald Trump. They all come from the same. It's the rod of my generation, but they're, they're, they got the power. I end up over there and uh, it was quite a war. I, you know, I saw a lot of action and I came back uh, fucked up. I have completely alienated, truly alienated and not even civilized in the way that New York City was. New York City was weird to me. It was like everyone was running around trying to make a buck. It was a very prosperous time, the late 60s. And uh, people were really hustling. Uh, it was a new kind of energy. And inflation was huge too because it, everything went up in price. And uh, I didn't belong. And I met a woman, thank God, a woman who tamed me, kind of brought me back to civilization, became my first wife. Uh, and during that time, I... After a year, I felt able to go back to a school, and I went to this, as, I, as you told the story, went back to film school because it interested me. I loved movies, but I didn't have any connections to them. Uh, but it's funny, when I went to the NYU, one of the things I remember is I kept going to screenwriting class, and it was empty. It, the, uh, the other students were all loving uh, the auteurs of Godard and uh, Truffaut mm -hmm. and, and Fellini. They all thought, you know, we'll go to the set and we'll solve it there. Well, that kind of doesn't work. I mean, you, it, it's beautiful if you are a genius, but it, usually you need a, a developed script. So I stayed with the writing at the same time and developed an eye based on what I'd seen in Vietnam, which is to be visceral. To if There was a savagery early on in my writing and in my, in my visualization in films. I got criticized a lot for it, but uh, as being... Uh, a right-wing, uh, fascist, uh, a, a vi violence-loving exploit exploitation movies, that kind of thing. Uh, Marty was a teacher, and he was one of, but he was, at the, he was just Marty. He wasn't Martin, you know. He was the long hair, right. the shoulders. He was doing Who's That Knocking at My Door, I believe. And he was, everyone loved his class because it was just full of energy. He, he loved films like A Priest Loves uh, the Church, you know. He was... I think the diary of a country priest about sums him up, but he was very, he was fun and intense. And one day I made this short film of 12 minutes long. It was one of my projects about a Vietnam veteran in New York. And it, we used to sit around the class. I don't know if you ever had this experience. We have, it was like the Chinese cultural revolution. People would mm -hmm. criticize you. So you make a film, you could put it up there and it's, the other students tear you apart. It's cannibalism. And uh, the kid, yeah, I, never I, was, had that I was waiting for the kids to, the other kids to destroy the film. He film finished. He said, that's a filmmaker to the class. And, About you. That's a filmmaker. Uh, he said, why? Because it's personal. Because he cares. You feel that there's somebody behind the film who cares what he's doing. He's telling a story that's close to him. And I remember those words because that was really important to him as it was in his own work. Uh, I didn't have the same background at that point, but. I only knew that I had been through this great upbringing and I was seeing this savagery over there. It just didn't make sense. You know, I had not still put it all together. Right. And uh, that was my diploma in effect. I mean, I did another year there and it, it, there was a lot of things. And then I got it. And then we got out of there and I, I drove a cab. I was a production assistant on several films, including a porno. I, I did uh, anything I could. Eventually I ended up advertising business. Always writing scripts, always writing scripts in this period. Uh, never stopped. I had two scripts a year, and they were all rejected. About 12, 10, 12 sc screenplays and treatments I wrote. It took me a few years to get recognized. I wrote Platoon in 76. That was recognized finally as a, as a, as a, as my name got around a little bit. But nobody seen there was nobody wanted to make the movie. It was nobody a, wanted to make Platoon, of course not. Yeah, right? it was a lousy fucking experience. It was a bummer, and yeah. uh, so forth and so on. And I had to sit through all of this years of uh, bullshit. I mean, ten more years. I mean, I had to live through uh, Rambo. <laughs> I had to live through Sylvester Stallone goes back to Vietnam to get the prisoners. We have our 
to get POWs and we right. have our hands tied behind our back kind of political reasoning. I had to sit through Chuck Norris, really dumb films, but made a lot of money missing in action. Yeah. So this was all heartbreaking, but there was no way. They turned me down three times. I almost made the movie. Mm. The second time was heartbreaking. Uh, and I believe, and I write about it in the book, that it was, it was turned, Dino De Laurentiis was going to put up three million bucks. All he wanted was a guarantee from MGM that they'd put up three million in distribution money to make his deal, to get his deal. And they wouldn't do it. And it, it dawned on me that Henry Kissinger and uh, Alex, Alexander Haig, you remember him, Secretary, yeah. mad, rabid Secretary of State under Reagan. Uh, I'm in charge here. We're, we're on the board of directors. and. Uh, uh, you know, you never know the reasons why, but all of a sudden they turned on Dino. I mean, they made every movie with Dino. Dino, this video revolution was happening at that time. Dino was producing Blue Velvet, if you remember, which for the same amount of money, but they, and that was pretty risque. But they did that, but they wouldn't do Platoon. That was aggravating. Well, how did it finally get made? Well, an Englishman made it. No American studio would touch it. Uh, no American independent would touch it. It was John Daly. John Daly is the hero of my journey at that point because he financed both Platoon and Salvador back to back. He asked me, in fact, which, Oliver, which one do you want to do first, Salvador or Platoon? I was stunned. Nobody gets asked that question in our business. Wow. These are low budget affairs. And I said, without, I said Salvador because I figured that Platoon would go down the toilet if I said Platoon. It would be a third time and I couldn't take it. My heart would be broken. So you did Salvador. And Salvador was a learning experience beyond measure. I mean, uh, it, was, it was going through hell to make that. It was so complicated to pull off a big picture with 93 speaking parts, two countries, uh, two cultures, uh, massacres, uh, horse charge, tanks. And, and, you had, and you had to work with James Woods and Jim Belushi. <laughs> and of course, James Woods. Uh, is uh, uh, is James Woods? <laughs> he was great. He got an Oscar nomination. We were nice. at each other. Great, he was a great actor. Yes, he, um, we were at each other's throats during the whole shooting because he was a star and I was a nobody. But anyway, yeah. uh, it no, was but a, both of them did an incredible job uh, yeah. in that film. But the film was so there was nothing like it, Oliver. That's right. When it came out, that we the, what we know of as war movies. This was you're on the edge of your seat. You're, you're watching this, you're an American watching it, and so you know, you see the result of our tax dollars at work. Yeah, um, in, among uh, other things, you know, America backed in Central America and w wherever in the world, always backs the death squads uh, and the killers. Yeah. Always does. I don't know why, but they always find a reason. Yeah. And they were fighting, they thought they, Mr. Reagan said we were fighting communists who were gonna cross the Rio Grande. I remember that one, that was such nonsense. We were fighting peasants, reformers, trade unionists, uh, teachers. I mean, those are the people who got killed. And priests, too. They killed the Archbishop of uh, Salvador. Romero. Romero. It was a major, a major crime. That they buried? Uh, it was awful. Oh, yeah. The nuns, the American nuns, and the lay worker, Jeannie Donovan. Yeah. So my friend Richard Boyle, who was a journalist who'd been down there, had written a little story. I saw that story in the backseat of his broken-down car. And I read it, and I said, "This is this is." By this time, I've been dropped out of the business. I'd done Scar, I'd written Scarface and Year of the Dragon, Midnight Express, and none of this. They were successful, but none of them had done me much. Certainly not Year, uh, Scarface was not at the time didn't do me much good. So I was sort of out of the business, and I started. I, I decided to start over. I put my own mortgage money in. I put everything I could into getting that. Salvador done and it thank God Daly came in because I would have gone bu bu bust and never completed it But I, I was saved by an Englishman because as I say no American studio even when it was finished the film They turned off the film in the middle of one of the companies. Yeah, it was depressing and I kept thinking it's political But I I wasn't sure. I mean, I kept thinking it's because the film had truly revolutionary sympathies but you wouldn't and yeah. I don't think you can get away with that. In the politics, and it would be hard to get an American to... to I wanted to... Uh, my, my model was Zapata, you know, which I thought moved me very much, loved it. But nobody, uh, as Daryl Zanuck himself said, it was not that successful when it opened. 
I heard, I learned the lesson the hard way. You make a film about Latin America, Central America, very little chance of uh, being successful. For some well, reason, it inspired me. And thank you. Yeah, but successful in the sense I of film. Sense that, that it is possible to make a movie that is political. It's it's really about telling a, a good story too. That's correct. That, that people will listen to the politics if you're able to tell a good story. If you make a good movie, if you make a great movie, which you know, if people were to ask me, what's your favorite Oliver Stone film? I think eight times out of 10, when I'm asked that question, I would say Salvador. Oh, um, great. Is that okay to say that? Are you, is, whatever. You I mean, that? You, listen, I'll take whatever you got. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's so many great ones to choose from, but I just think that that, in that moment, it moved me. It's a few years before I'm going to make my first film, but I really started to think about the power of film. And, and by telling a good story, um, uh, you can move people in that way. And you've done that, you know, many times over. Just the fact that you would take on, how do you pitch a film? Now, by the, the time you make Wall Street, you know, you are now, you've had, you know, some great success at that time. But, but still, <laughs> the pitch is, I'm gonna, what's the, what's the storyline here? Um, capitalism. <laughs> it's like no that was a, you're actually you're right there was very few business movies being made yes but right. my, mo my model for that was my father who'd been in wall street and uh, a film called executive suite by robert wise 1957 i believe mm -hmm. william holden was in it so very good business film it's about the back door the back backstory on on corporations i love that film as well as frank capra's movie with uh, walter houston 1932 American Madness. You got, you got to see that one if you. Oh, I've never seen that. American Madness. It, it'd be easy in the depression to go after the bankers, but Capra spins it, where Walter Houston is one of, is one of the good bankers, and when he's being the most pressured by his depositors to get their money back, he actually pays them off. He pays the depositors off, and he starts to go bust, and he's saved at the last second. You know, a Capra esque ending, but great story. Uh, mm -hmm. When I, uh, the Wall Street, nobody was interested either, but. I had the clout with Platoon and the Oscar. I had the clout to actually go to Fox uh, and they were competing against Warner Brothers. So that's amazing. You get, first of all, you get two studios that want you and they're competing. So I got a, a lot of money to make. I got 17, 18 million dollars to make this movie in New York, which I never had dreamed of. Wow. Uh, and uh, it was my first studio film and it actually worked, although they, I don't think that Barry Diller was happy with the movie or Rupert Murdoch, who owned the studio, began just owned the, bought the studio. I don't think right. he liked it. Right. I, I know I know Diller didn't like it, uh, but that's another story. I, I would like to say one thing that on the Salvador is that the reason it was saved, it was, its reputation was saved, was because I made Platoon right after it. And Platoon had a, had a life of its own. It was time that... Vietnam would come around in a realistic way to the American people. And that film took off of its own. You didn't need critics, nothing. It opened on a, yeah. on a Friday it was, and in New York, it was around the block. Veterans, all mostly veterans. They came in silently. They sat down. First show, 12 o'clock noon or whatever. Silence for the whole movie. And then ends and... Uh, they, there was silence in the, they were just sitting there stunned, many of them weeping. It was an amazing experience to see that. Yes. And for the first two weeks, it was mostly veterans. And then women started to come and, and then it expanded. It, the film ran for a, uh, four or five months. Right. And, it was there. and uh, all over the world, Michael, not just New York, not just America. It really did great business everywhere. <laughs> that rarely happens. You get good reviews, you, you get the Oscar, and you do good business. It's really, a, as you know, is a trifecta, and you can't yeah. do it. I knew then, even at the eight, and I was 40 years old, I'd finally achieved a dream. I knew then that uh, it just doesn't get better when you, than when you realize that first dream. And uh, When you do realize it, when, you, when it does happen to you, um, what then... What happened with you? How did you take it? How did you decide to use this well, gift, essentially? I'm thinking of you. I mean, you get up on the stage, you get an Oscar, and you get booed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we, it was the fifth night of the Iraq War. I just could not just say nothing. Um, yeah. but, well, uh, you did the right thing, but people yeah. didn't understand. At the time, they, they didn't, did not like it, yeah. Um, 
Oh, you, you, you were not booed off the stage, though, when you went up to get your Oscar. No, no, no. I was a moderate, and I still did not had not developed the political feelings that you had. I was still w learning the ropes, as I said in the book. I said these were baby steps. I'd come back from Vietnam, and I'd been influenced by my trip to Salvador. I'd seen these countries, and I saw the same stuff I saw in, in Vietnam as a teacher, actually, in 65. I saw the army coming into Honduras, Tegucigalpa, uh, into, uh, we were moving in around Nicaragua. People forget, but Mr. Reagan was really planning an attack on the Nicaraguan revolutionary government with, right. by supporting the Contras. We mined their harbors. We, uh, the Iran-Contra scandal is perhaps the most shocking scandal ever been discovered in American history, in my opinion, because Reagan was selling weapons to Iran, which was illegal, and he was taking the money, he died, he, he, did, he, he split it up, gave half of it to the Contras. Right. It was all of the North. It was an ugly story, and it never came out in its fullest. And George Bush, the father, was, was de definitely involved, and he got off, like, he got off scot-free, as did Reagan. It was a, another one of these American scandals that get buried, get buried by the powers that be. And what's her name from the Washington Post? Catherine Graham. She, she was part of that. She, she buried it. You know what she said at the time? Mm. She, because they had, Watergate, Watergate had come from the Post. I mean, had, a lot of that had come from the Post. Right. She said, we, America can't afford another Watergate. Now, wow. It's not, her, it's not her opinion. It's not her right to exercise judgment on what's a story and what's not a story. And that's the problem with the media in our country. They, they're, they're, they're become judges, too, uh, of what's good and what's not good for the American people. Damn it, that was a real missed opportunity. But uh, Salvador was got, uh, got a reputation when, after Platoon came out and made the Oscar nomination. So I was up against myself the same night on screenplay. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy Woods, was, his performance was great, and he got nominated too. And for incredible performance, he was so nervous and so, so mad. He was mad. And, he was like crazy too. I like that. And he had a lot of life, a lot of yeah. life. But his politics ended up being the opposite. Oh of yeah, that's something else. Of the movie. Yeah. How does that happen to people? I don't hold it against a person. I mean, I can get along with anybody if they're yeah. the, if uh, they're interesting. Certainly, Jimmy is interesting. Right. Right. Um. So so you mentioned your dad, um, and. In making Wall Street, in the book, you talk about uh, how capitalism uh, chewed him up and spit him out. Your dad, so your dad worked for Shershon Lehman. Uh, and Hayden, Stone, Hayden Stone, too. Not this, he's not the founding stone, but he worked for them for a long time. He got his company, he worked for it, got bought out by Sandy Weil. Now, Sandy Weil is the avatar of a new Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Sandy Weil, do you know the name? Sure, you know, of course, I know. Yeah, I know who it is. He is the apparently he's a great guy and all that, but he started to merge stock brokerage firms with travel companies, insurance companies. He, the whole kit you could buy in right. one package. Right. And it was his idea. And basically he was one of those guys who got, who ended the, uh, the, uh, separation between, uh, stock broking and, and banking. Uh, it had been illegal for, uh, 50 plus years. Reuben and Clinton, they opened the dam. Clinton opened the dam. 2008. My fa anyway, my father had started in Wall Street. He'd come out of college in the Depression and uh, couldn't get a job practically. He was a floor walker. Worked his way up through Wall Street finally. And in the world, in the Army, he was in financial affairs under Eisenhower's staff in Paris, where he met my mother, and in Berlin. He uh, worked very hard, honest man. Died in the wool, Republican, smart Republican, and uh, at the end of his life, the divorce killed him, and he was in debt for the rest of his life. Practically, he finally paid it off, but it was—it was not, you know. He, I finally paid it off, but he's like a prisoner who come out of jail for the after twenty years. I felt sorry for him in that way, but him and I, when I came back from Vietnam, we just couldn't agree. I, I'd been in combat; he'd never seen combat. He didn't understand. Uh, I was also crazy. I mean, I was take, smoking dope. Uh, I had long hair. 
was talking like a black man. I was everything, he, you know, he couldn't stand it. And we had many clashes. And one time I gave him some LSD, put it in his drink. I was so, I wanted to change his thinking. So Did I that work? Him. Did that work? No, but it was a, it was a hell of a trip he had. A sex trip. <laughs> it, was, it was at a party. So there was 14, 13, 12, 11 other people there. And I, he couldn't pick me out. He didn't know I did it. But uh -huh. I put it in the scotch when we were playing chess. Oh my God. <laughs> he uh, never got back on his feet. He was always struggling. Till the day he died, it was always tough for him. He got cut out from the Wall Street thing eventually, and he died a little too too young. I mean, it was part of that time, but he died before, unfortunately, before Salvador was, just before it was made, and he never saw the work. He only saw Midnight Express, so he kind of felt that I'd be okay. So neither your mother or your father really saw what became of all the films that you made. My mother did. Your mom did. Mother, yeah, she was very proud. And we reconciled. I didn't blame her anymore for the divorce. And I understood the reasons. And, you know, you, the more you understand, the more you forgive each. Right. Uh, and uh, So you were no longer estranged from your mom? No. Uh, no. I came uh, very close to her in the last 20 years, 30 years of her life. I had to take care of her, too, because my father didn't leave enough insurance. Mm. But uh, it's it was... Uh, you asked about my father's legacy and about capitalism. Definitely, he he got chewed up on that thing. Was, you see, they cut the commissions. They did everything. It was a, it was a world where the geckos came in and bought a lot of companies and stripped them of assets. In my father's day, first of all, they never talked about money that way. It was always... If you were rich, you never boasted about it. It's not like the vulgar times we're in with Donald Trump celebrating his wealth or the TV shows and all that stuff. And Americans are drunk on wealth, right? I mean, it seems to me since the 1980s, since Robin Leach times, mm -hmm. Americans are boasting about how many houses they have and all that stuff. It's disgusting. My father hated that kind of stuff. And his world was sober and... Uh, I, I think I miss it. I miss that kind of res respectability. I don't see it anymore. Well, right now, none of us are making movies. Uh, it's the, the movie business is shut down. Um, That's not a bad thing. It's except not. For the, <laughs> except Tell me, for the, well, yeah, because I think so, don't, don't you think on the on the other end of this post pandemic, what we do making movies, this is going to change. This is somehow. I don't know what or how, but do, don't you get this feeling that a lot of us, we've all had a lot of time to kind of think about what we want to be doing and, and, yes. and how we want to do it. And I'm just curious, uh, as you are one of our, our great uh, masters in this uh, art form, that uh, what your thoughts are in terms of, of what we do with this art form post-pandemic. Um. How would you like to come out of this? as a filmmaker and, and working with film. Michael, my last film was Snowden. Uh, it was 2016, killed myself on it. And uh, people in the country didn't much care about, it was a very important issue, what Snowden brought out to the world about the surveillance. Uh, oh, it's a, it's a wonderful cyber. film, I know. Why didn't, why didn't important. people want to watch that film? What do you think? Because they don't want to know, it's disturbing. Yeah. And uh, there was a documentary. They think they they know the issues because of a documentary, but this is a bigger. There's a bigger issue here. It's what the United States is doing with cyber warfare, and that has not been dealt with in our country. I mean, our attack on Iran and the many things we do under the under covert action around the world, interfering in regimes, regime change, all kinds of malice, destroying things in Iran. <laughs> Uh, it's it's very scary world, and we always, of course, blame others, and we we make, we say they're worse. And, you know, and uh, China seems to be the new the new enemy. We need enemies. I want to encourage people to uh, <clears throat> if they haven't seen Oliver's series, the Untold History of the United States. It was really uh, very powerful. Uh, all the things that you're not taught in school are yeah. are in this series. Yeah, um, I'll put a link. To it on my on my site here. Oh, thank you. I'd love no. I'd love for people to watch this and uh, it's and on Netflix too. It's you can get it on Netflix. Well. 
Oh, good. Yeah. They never gave it. Mainstream press never gave it any attention. And we did business in spite of, it was with progressive historians that broke yeah. it through. And people I, started to watch it, ordinary people who just didn't have much education, like I did in history. And they just discovered things and they, they didn't know. And I've gotten so many fan letters on this. Um, it's one of my best documentaries. And it's, it's, in fact, it's one of my highlights of my life. Wow. Well, yeah, it should, you should. I agree with that. Do you think, uh, as a filmmaker, do you, do you like the idea of the streamers, the Netflix? And, uh, uh, I, I can live with it. I, the, I can't, I, you know, this business has changed so much uh, from when I came in in 1970, 70s. Uh, I, I, I'm not, a, I, I can't tell you what's going to happen. I miss theaters because I like to see comedies. I like to see spectacles with people. You get yeah. a more of a feeling of yeah. a reaction. Uh, a streamer, you know, you can watch a comedy at home and you could say, what's so funny about it? Because no one else laughed. And I'm sure that happens. I think the comedy people would be very, would want to have the theaters back. It's very important to have laughter be uh, generic, be uh, congenial. A, a crowd helps. Same thing for uh, suspense films, a, a crowd helps. So I don't think uh, that's gonna happen. It, it doesn't make economic sense to have a theater anymore. And this oh. home screen makes things too easy. Television is being you think free. We're gonna, you think we're gonna lose our movie theaters? In a way, we'll have always some theaters, but in a way, I think the, mov the, mov the movie going tradition, the young people are not gonna be able to pick up on it to the degree we mm -hmm. once had. Well, the smaller towns, the place you come from. Uh, yeah, I, how what, how can they have, have a theater? You know. Well, I, I was I moved to a, a town of like fifteen thousand people in Michigan, and uh, and they didn't have a movie theater uh, in, within their city limits, and so but they still had this theater that had been built a hundred years ago, just boarded up and empty. And I just I went to the city and I said, hey, I'll restore this for you. And we can have a, a, thin, a cinema in, in town here. And so I did that because I just didn't move there. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine not being able to go down to the movies or something. So I just, uh, That's great. I, did, I just, started, I just, and then I, and then I did another theater up, up in Northern Michigan uh, just to get people coming and having the experience of seeing a movie with other people. That's the key thing. Yeah. I think I, I can't imagine, especially after five months of this virus, People want to get out of the house. People want to be able to go out. People want to go on a date. You know, what, what can you, what can you do anymore? Where can you go <laughs> that doesn't cost a hundred dollars? You can't go to a professional sports game. You can't go to a, a concert with a rock star or you can't, all of that costs an enormous amount of money these days, even going to a, a decent restaurant, but a movie, a movie is still, depending on what part of the country you live in, 10, Twelve dollars, big cities. It's you know fifteen to eighteen dollars, but still, it's you know it's more affordable than anything else. I can't imagine that it would die. Um, I yeah, it's the, so you see the end of civilization here, so to speak. I, I, <laughs> I sort of well, I feel it's one of the pieces of it because yeah. I I believe in the power of us coming together. And experiencing the same thing, and whether that thing is making us cry, whether it's making us laugh, whether it's getting us angry, we are communally and collectively experiencing it, and therefore, I gotta believe some good will come out of that. I agree. Am I? I'm not nuts, right? No, not at all. It's uh, what is going to happen. I don't know. You get to a certain age. Uh, you, be, I, I guess, I'm a fatalist about it. You know, I, I can't do anything about it except my little my small contributions. And is it wrong for me or the public to ask you to not give up? Like that, so you had this experience in 2016 with your last theatrical Yeah, feature. that was tough. That was tough. No, no, we just don't, we don't want, I believe that fiction writers and filmmakers such as yourself, great ones such as yourself, speak, I think, sometimes larger truths than what you would get in a work of nonfiction. Uh, not to not to put that down, but I'm just saying that that uh, what's the old the, the line from Picasso about the uh, but through fiction by essentially lying you tell a greater truth, and yeah. um, and so to so we because you're one of these truth tellers because of yeah. you know, the stories you make up 
or they're stories that are based on historical incidents, maybe or whatever, but it's still your voice that right. you know, you're still a young man and you, there's, there's no reason that, uh, but this is easy for me to say, I mean, to, for, I can't say to you, you must go make more movies. You have every right after the wonderful body of work that, that you've created to say, I've retired, or I don't want to do this anymore, or I want to do other things. I want to try to save the planet. It's going to choke to death. I'm not kidding myself. I mean, I see that I can, by making documentaries, I can also contribute. And making a film about nuclear energy and clean energy is important to the planet. And it's as much as I can do now, because I thought about doing it as a, uh, as a fiction film, you know, a storyline, and making it suspenseful and having a lot of tension. Uh, it's a bit like Snowden and how difficult it is to put a story of this magnitude into a film box is a challenging thing. And I, I just couldn't solve it. I, there was a script someone wrote and we worked on it, but it didn't work as a movie. Movies have to work. Uh, they're too risky. They're too big. Uh, take too much energy. You don't want to miss. Uh, it has to be a bullseye. You gotta, you gotta aim it right. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I don't think it's possible to do some big subject matter like history, like untold history. I couldn't do it as a film. It was, no, that should, that should be an episodic series the way you did it. Yeah. That's correct. But I'm saying you don't think that there's another feature film, a theatrical film in you. Uh, oh, there might be. I don't know what I don't know what it is right now. Uh, you know, I, I, I people send me things, and you'd love to find something you could get your soul into, uh, but it demands for me. A, a, I have to be fully into it, and it's hard uh, to to buy into some of the fiction devices we use. It's hard. I see all the tricks, you know, I see, I see how it's done and I admire other filmmakers for doing it. There has been some very good films recently. Also, it never ends. There's always good filmmakers. Uh, I like Joker. I like Parasite. I like uh, Uncut Gems. I mean, there was films last year. Wonderful. Uncut Gems stands out to me. Uh, so does Joker, actually. Uh, yeah, that was a powerful film. Yes, Joker. it was. It was very powerful. So I've done eight documentaries now. Uh, and they're, every one of them has fascinated me because I was dealing with people who were out there, people who had challenged all the conventional thinking. Uh, it's exciting. Documentaries, I guess for you, is, is old hat, but for me, I've only done it since 2001. It's exciting. Castro was my first subject matter. Yeah. Fidel Castro, who everybody in the U.S. continues to hate. I don't understand why, because he resisted us. You know, yeah, we don't like that. No. Yeah, <laughs> he said no yeah. to the people who are in charge. Yes, <laughs> it. Uh, no, I don't. Yeah, maybe I'm. I'm the opposite here. Where after making all these documentaries, well, maybe I, you should I, make your second film. Yeah, I, I need to make the the next my second feature narrative feature uh, fiction. Uh, I I've actually, so. I've, I've, I've got. I've, I've actually started the process. I don't really want to say this publicly because um, uh, people, I'll get all this mail from people and say, oh, no, you have to keep making more documentaries. But <laughs> actually, I've been writing a, a screenplay or two that I think might actually speak to those greater truths Great. by doing them as works of, of fiction. I don't know. Well, we'll see. You're quite a provocateur in your way, and you know it. <laughs> uh, I'd like to. I love the time you went up to Charlton Heston's house and tried to get in. <laughs> it was very yeah. funny. Yeah. And also, <laughs> Roger and me were, he was great. He was a great foil for you. Yeah. Well, you know, you listen, as, as, because you really started out loving writing, uh, you know, you know that the, the aspects of telling a good story involve the antagonist and the protagonist and the, and, um, and the and the the arc of of it all. It's all when I'm making. I, I somebody asked me to write up my rules of documentary filmmaking, so I wrote these thirteen rules. And number one was uh, the first rule of making a documentary is don't make a documentary, make a movie, because <laughs> you're asking people to watch it as a movie. And if you don't honor the the art form of a movie, if you're just there to point your finger or wag your finger or you know, just preach, preach, preach. I, I don't think people go to the movies for that. They, they go to church for preaching and they 
or they join a political organization if they want to go to a rally or a protest or whatever. But a movie should be a movie, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. That's how, I've always felt that way. And I've, I think that I've, I've had the audience I've had over all these years because if they go to see my movie, especially in a movie theater on a Friday night, I, I, it's <laughs> not going to feel like medicine. It's, it's going it's yeah. to be funny. Uh, it's going to be sad. It's going to make you angry, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, it might make you angry at me, um, but but uh, it will evoke the things that you and I as filmmakers want to evoke, want the audience to come alive. And when they leave their seat and they leave the theater, there's something that's just, you know this, whenever you've seen a great film, you're just, something's rushing through you. You know, sure. I, usually have to, I have to go for a long walk. If I walk out of a theater and I've just seen something brilliant, like Joker last year or, uh, or Parasite. Uh, I just, I have to, I have to go for a long walk yeah. because it's, it's affected me and it's in my bloodstream right now. And, um, you know, and, and that was the thrill of going to movies. My father used to take me to the movies. He always went to the good ones. The bridge on the river Kwai was one of his favorites. And he would come out of the theater and he said, you know, kiddo, did you notice that this was not logical and it led to that and that led back to this? And we would, and I'd say, I don't understand that I was very young and I think along his lines because he was very logical. He played great chess. And at the end of our debate, he would always say, well, you know, kiddo, we could have done it better. And of course, everybody who goes to a movie thinks he can do it better. It seems like <laughs> you know what it's like. Everybody thinks he can do a movie. You mentioned this in your book that he probably planted the first seed in your head of to be a how, to, yeah. how, to make a good, how to make a good movie. Yeah. Those talks. Why'd you call the book Chasing the Light? Because it's the last shot of the day and it's the hardest. Yeah. You're rushing. I was always in a bind. It would be four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, the light's going at seven. I got five shots to go. I want yeah. my head with five shots. I can't get them. I know I'm not going to make it. I have to decide under pressure, what are the, what do I need? Not what I want. What do I need? And that is the key to making the end of the day work. Chasing the light is often frustrating. I got some of my best work that way. Some of the best things that we ever did were because of that. That pressure, it, you force yourself to... Right. Well, you, you, you essentially have to be the editor in that moment. Yeah, oh yeah. You're yeah, editing the film and you're trying to figure out which of these five, I'm only going to get two or three off. So yeah. I'm not, if I, and we're not going to come back to this beach to shoot again. We're or do you have the money for another day? You just don't have You don't have the money. So you've got to make a decision right then. You've got to edit your movie right then yeah. on the spot. Yeah. And, and and you're saying it actually forced you into making some of the best decisions you've made in your in your filmmaking career. Yeah. But I didn't dawdle in the middle of the day either. I used every moment I could. If I if it, the, the light was harsh, we'd figure out a way to shoot something. We'd never let right. we'd never waste a second on a set. It's just too too fragile. Uh, you need I I need a lot of shots to make a movie, and I never stop pushing. I'm exhausted after I shoot a film. Exhausted. Um, yeah, yeah. Twenty films. Uh, yeah. The uh, so and also chasing the light is on a metaphoric level is you know what it means. It means I'm always running down a rabbit hole. I always felt mm -hmm. like I was being pushed or pulled. Right. I felt like a rabbit. And I think when I hit platoon finally in 1986 at 40 years old, for me that was a it was a meaningful break. It was like. Yeah, and now what are you worried about? All you, you, you achieved a dream that you always wanted to do. You actually became a director, a writer-director. You made a movie. What else is sweeter? Elizabeth Taylor kisses you and gives you the Oscar. And Wow, that's who gave you your Oscar, it was Elizabeth yeah, Taylor. The money, yeah. is, the, money, the money is pouring in. And, of course, life goes on, but it's a whole other kind of level that you go to. And... We'll right. talk about that when I come on to your show for the next book. Hopefully, we'll still be around. Yes, or we can talk about your documentary, too, when you're finished with it. That'd be great. Also finishing a documentary, four hours long. We've done it over the last year on the JFK case. We went oh. back into the facts because the, the movie created the Assassination Records Review Board that existed for five years. They did a lot of work, a lot of investigating, uh, not investigating, uh, revealing records. The records 
Some of them are still hidden by Trump. If you remember, he, he didn't open them all as he promised. But right. the point is that we have enough information revealed there that we wanted to bring it out to the public and say, this is more on the case. This you don't know. And you have to be careful because it seems pretty clear that our intelligence agencies, you know, supposed to be so sacred, they had something to do with this that was very serious. I think that when Kennedy was killed that day, I think it was there was a signal from the intelligence agencies of our country that, that who was in control here. Right. Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Well, it tells you something that, that they still, these companies that are supposed to be so free, free speech, are still worried about the Kennedy case. It just tells you a lot. They're nervous about what you're going to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Well, yeah, but it got it got me excited. I want to see this film. So um, uh, I don't have good advice to give you other than do what you've done in the past. Look to the Europeans and the Australians and the Japanese. Um, most of my films, at least the majority of them, have been funded not by Americans, but by Brits and Dutch and Canadians and Australians and others. That's where I've been able to have my voice heard, and they don't censor me. Uh, so I, I, I've been able to say the things I've wanted to say in my, in my films without having to, you know, to worry about that. I think only three of my films were from beginning to end where it was completely American money. So I found the, the best way to get my, film, my films out to Americans is not have American money in it. Thank you, Michael, for the advice. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for letting me uh, sit there on the set of the doors. <laughs> uh, something I'll never forget. And, um, and thank you for these important, important films that you've made. Uh, I hope you know the world of good that you've done by sharing these That's stories so and these films with us. I much appreciate it. And good luck with the book. Chasing the Light, everybody, is Oliver Stone's book. It's a great memoir. Um, and you get to hear all the stories from uh, Scarface uh, to Platoon. It's, it's an amazing... And Midnight Express, too. <laughs> Midnight Express is in there. Uh, the Hand. What's the, other, what's the other one after Scarface? Another big one that people probably aren't You're aware of. Uh, you're, you're the Dragon. You're the Dragon. But yeah, what's that? There's another one you wrote. Um, uh, you uh, eight Million Ways to Die? No, Conan. no. Conan uh, the Barbarian. No, no. Oh, Conan, yes. Conan the Barbarian. Conan the Barbarian. Yes, if, like, like if you were to do a quiz with people uh, who wrote Conan the Barbarian and you'd have all, you'd have four names and yours is one of the names. Nobody would pick your name for that. But, uh, uh, but again, another, another huge cult classic all these years later. And um, so thank you for all of this. Thank you. Okay. Be well. And thank you everybody for listening to this edition of rumble with Michael Moore. And thank you to our executive producer, Basil Hamden our editor and sound engineer, Nick Quaz. And uh, please feel free to write me at mike at michaelmoore.com or leave a voicemail right here on the podcast page. And I'll have some links and stuff to show you here uh, from Oliver's work and from his book. Thank you, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.